All right, and here I am with Josh Ledgard of Kickoff Labs. Josh, how's it going, man? It's going great. How are you doing, Brian? Doing good. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me. Um, so, uh, Kickoff Labs. For those who may not know what it is, obviously you guys have been around for a while, and you and you're pretty well known at this point. But yeah, for those who don't know, why don't you introduce us? What what is it? <laughs> Yeah, Kickoff Labs is uh, at its root uh, a system for doing uh, lead capture and lead generation. So uh, we have a foundation platform of uh, landing pages, opt-in forms you can embed on your website, um, and most importantly, um, a way to make that process more engaging with the people you're doing leads with. So uh, we can make it uh, really simple to run a viral contest, for example, where uh, somebody signs up and you give them credits for referring a friend, they either get you know a higher chance of winning whatever contest you're running or move up in the wait list, or if you just want to give out something for they get their fifth referral, we make it really easy. Like somebody gets you your fifth extra referral onto your onto your uh, into fifth extra lead into your service, then you can send them an email and congratulate them and um, do whatever gift prize distribution you like at, uh, at that point. So uh, you know, really simply, maybe viral lead generation is a good way to yeah. good way to put it. Um, that's uh, that's been been our focus for a, a while now. Yeah, that's that's really cool. You know, the um, that just the way to incentivize people to to go out and share it. I mean, there's a thousand different tools that let you put a form or an opt in pop up on your site, but this yeah. really goes the extra mile of of you know really kind of putting in that that viral loop between the contests and the incentives to share it yeah, yeah totally yeah i'm i'm really i'm really interested in what happens as part of the customer relationship um and so i, I kind of view there's so much marketing you know, the foundation of marketing starts out as like really static right you show people a static ad you bring them to a static website there's not much they can interact with and do um and i think the the future is anything that creates a, a more engaging relationship with your best customers and your influencers and things that you know contests are just one thing that create a more engaging relationship where you get sort of your biggest fans participating and promoting them um pro promoting your brand uh, around the internet and uh, to me that's just more fun than just like a landing page or a form that you know you fill it out and it says thanks like yeah there's got to be something like whether it's you know you, you know uh, your concept of like opt-in bribes like whether you're giving them some sort of knowledge or you're making it a fun process like there's got to be something more in my mind and that's uh and that's kind of been the, the uh, premise behind kickoff labs for a long time yeah absolutely so um so when when did kickoff labs actually start uh, 2011. Okay. So what about five, six years now? Yeah. Very nice. And, uh, what, what were you, and you have uh, a couple partners on this, right? Or, or just, uh, it's one co-founder. So myself and okay. Scott Watermazic. Um, right. so we, uh, we both, uh, founded it together. We, uh, left, uh, the previous company we we're at, um, within a couple months of each other and, uh, and decided to start, uh, start this company. Got it. And so, so what were you, what was kind of your role previously and what kind of stuff were you guys focused on before kickoff labs? Um, both of us are on the engineering side. So I was, uh, I was essentially in charge of a, uh, you know, 30 person product team at a company called, uh, intelligent. Um, and they did uh, social software. So that's where I got the concept that like software, like online should be engaging because they did blogs, support forums, wikis um, for enterprises. So like the Dell support forums, for example, were a customer um, of intelligence. And so um, I, I was always interested in sort of that interactive nature of social online, interactive nature of software. Um, and, uh, and Scott was the, uh, VP of, uh, product architecture there. So, uh, he was really at a high level, the guy who loved experimenting with a uh, new technology and saying, Hey, here's what we could use this new service or this new thing for, uh, let's try it out. Hmm. So, so the two of you come from like an engineering background together. Like, did you have complementary skills or were you both kind of on the technical side? <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott is more technical than I am. I'd say I'm. I'm definitely the the person who picks up like uh, looking at like the design, looking at the marketing, looking yeah. at support. Um, and um, Scott this morning said to me, he says like after six years, you still don't know enough rails. It scares me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running this software. I was like, well, that's not all I do. So yeah. um, I'd be scared too if that was my full time job. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, so when you guys kind of you know went went out uh, on on your own and started this, like what actually led to um, the idea to start this 
as, as it, like were you kicking around different ideas or, or was kickoff labs the original idea uh we had a lot of ideas i mean we uh we literally we went through a process we uh we wrote down kind of brainstormed and came up with maybe 35 40 kind of ideas described in like a paragraph or two each um and just literally just wrote them all down like a, not just a one sentence description but maybe you know the really quick you know 30 second elevator pitch uh, for each of the ideas uh, behind beyond the one sentence description. Uh, we had ideas that ranged from uh, from, from like a you know a blog that focused on craft beer, all you know, all the way through these really high level like enterprise type support tools and stuff like that. You know, that was uh, different than what we've done at uh, Intelligent before. And so, you know, there was a pretty wide range of ideas, and uh, we kind of took a first pass and said, you know, we threw out about half of them said like, well, we really don't have any background in any of these, you know, um, or, you know, I like to drink beer. I don't know that I want to write about <laughs> <Yeah>. it every day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I really don't know if like, you know, we really have the background for pulling that off, um, right. and, uh, kind of match things that uh, align closer to our skill sets first. Um, and then from that half list of maybe like 15, um, kind of started uh, started expanding, talking them through, and ultimately came down to like five ideas um, that we had, and really started writing. We wrote out like a probably about four to six page business plans for each of those five ideas of sort of what you know the what the the launch and the market would look like, and what our opportunity was, and what kind of products in that space we could you know, stagger and launch. Um, and it just, it kind of hit us as, you know, it's hitting a lot of people back then that like, boy, you know, you can make the numbers say anything. Like if you get, you know, 2% of a, you know, $1 billion market, like you're rich. Like it just, sure. it all looks good. And the numbers you can massage a business plan and you can make it look really great. And they all look really great. And, you know, probably any of them could have been made um, successful <laughs> in the end. I think that's, uh, that was probably, probably would have been true. Uh, but, what we realized is like, well, what matters is can we pull in an audience and get people interested in purchasing the product? And so we thought like, well, what we really need is proof that somebody will give us their email address. And so then we said, boy, if only there was a way to create five similar pages really quickly that, you know, people would use to give us their email address and see if they were interested enough to tell their friends about, <laughs> tell their friends about it. Wow. Um, and so like, like, oh, well, there's idea number six. Let's create that product because we're engineers. Let's just build that really quickly for ourselves put out the six pages and then um you know we started going to meetup groups um and and meeting you know, other developers and marketers and kind of like pitching around the different ideas and we had a website up for for each of them and seeing like which one we could get people to go sign up for um kind of for each of the different audiences um and we were kind of left between uh, two ideas and kickoff labs by far and away the one we were getting uh, the most traction, although it's felt probably self-selecting since it was useful to people in entrepreneurial spaces that we were going around in at the time. Yeah. Um, and so we also had a more um, enterprise -y side um, sort of uh, uh, it, it's more common now, but at the time, like a tool to set or sort of take tweets and mine them for support, but then also route them appropriately to your marketing team to respond to or the person who's creating an assignment queue for uh, for Twitter uh, for large for larger companies. Uh, that was called Sif uh, Social, and we actually built uh, built out both of them for like the first uh, for like the first year or so. Um, like and both, both kickoff just, labs and the. The Twitter support one, and yeah, the the the, the Twitter uh, the Twitter tool called, called uh, Sif Social. We built both of those out, um, and it just turned out like uh, Kickoff Labs was or was ready faster. Um, had a pricing page up faster, and uh, yeah. we started getting revenue. Um, and the sales cycle for selling to larger companies just sort of uh, frustrated uh, frustrated me. Um, trying to get a larger company to to buy off because you know we were running demos like three different larger company demos and they'd always have these questions oh can you can it do this can it do that and it was just hard to get to uh, harder to get to yes than you know a product that was like at the time like fifteen dollars a month I'll just sign up and pay it and right. you know people were using it they seemed really happy and at one point we realized we had uh, like twenty thousand dollars a month in revenue. Uh, from one product and almost no revenue from the other product that we were spending time on. And I had a, a mentor say to me, like, why are you even working on this thing that's paying you nothing? Yeah. Like, you've <laughs> yeah, got sometimes money. It, it just takes an outsider to, to really look at a situation, you know, because you've been working on something for so long and you had this you vision. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I think it's really interesting that you had this list of, of like 20 ideas and Kickoff Labs wasn't even really on that list to begin with. 
and it was the like the line yeah. like the launch pages that became yeah. kickoff labs that that's really interesting um so so was it out of that that, that first uh between the meetup groups and getting those landing pages out there, collecting email addresses, is that where the first cust- like paying customers came from for Kickoff Labs? Yeah, that's uh, that's really where the first uh, the first paying customers came from. People that signed up uh, signed up in advance, and then uh, and then when we had a pricing page, they signed up uh, they signed up to pay. I'm trying to like think back to like 2011. You know, like these days validation and like the lean startup and all the all the common like tactics and everything like they weren't really commonplace back then uh, i mean no, SaaS, was, SaaS was, was around but not as not as like crazy competitive the language the language and the concepts i mean people were starting to understand because like i said you know i was going to startup meetups around the seattle area and i was going to uh to, to events and people were starting to get the concepts but we're very even that community was still very much like a very build first ask questions later sort of mentality going through startups and um these large sort of you know product endeavors that were just, you know, know, I'd see them because I'd see people putting a lot of effort into them and just launch and fail because they had no audience. Yeah. Um, And, uh, and people not realizing like that's the hardest thing. Yeah. And I feel Um, like kickoff labs came about right around that time when people were just getting around to that idea. Like, Oh, you don't build in stealth. You have to get it out there ahead of your launch and start building an early access list. Um, yeah, I feel like and, that was really. Tough. And now we're starting to see that idea tri- trickle into both larger companies and also uh, as they larger companies try and get more entrepreneurial and, and create some smaller teams to create some like additional products or a secondary product. And we're starting to see it in, even the small businesses are starting to come around to like, wow, I should like you know test market this new idea for my for my service or my business before I uh, before I do or I should you know run a contest to get you know do this engaged marketing and, like that idea is just now starting to get. Uh, more, I'd say, mainstream in the in the you know, small business space. Once you get out of your bubble of like people who work in software and SaaS services, like you'll see those ideas percolating into the mainstream more, more and more nowadays. Got it. Yeah. Um, so early on, I mean, you guys are coming from from kind of a, an engineering technical background. Um, you know, product pretty well. But the what was like the first thing that you kind of outsourced or delegated to someone else that like that you were like all right we just don't have this capability in-house um and it's not really a good use of our time like what was the first thing in, in that product case? support support hands down product support <laughs> um not that we couldn't be good at it but a it's it's disruptive right because you want to get back to customers as quickly as possible if somebody writes in especially you know in the in the first uh you know first six months you don't have that many people like being successful with the product or trying to use it you you, you want to like take super good care you always want to take really good care of your character but the customers but back then it's like wow this person wrote in they're using the software i'm going to stop everything i'm doing mm-hmm. and get to helping them and then you do that enough times and realize that the opportunity cost loss of like scott and i doing that was a huge and then b you know I think I don't think either of us had a natural have a natural mentality to um, to make customers really happy. Where as soon as we hired a support person, you know, one of their early replies that wrote back was like, "Wow, I can see the frustration you're having." By the way, I think it's a really cool campaign you're trying to run. Like they like started yeah. out with this empathy, and my that. answers were always like, "Here's how you solve your problem." Yeah. Like, yeah. press the um, button on this page and then you're done. Like, yeah, press the button on this page and you're done. But when like there was somebody who's had a background in doing customer support for other companies and had that mentality, I was like, I was like, oh, this is not only like this is not only good for me to like get my time back. This is better a better experience for our customers because they. You know, they want to be heard. Like, even if their problem is solved, they want to hear that, like, you know, they want somebody to understand, like, oh, this was really frustrating for them. Right. Uh, you know, and so uh, that wasn't a skill set that, uh, that Scott and I had uh, in spades. And so outsourcing that first was, uh, was a really smart idea because it was a very kind of disruptive task yeah. otherwise. And because I think customers got a better experience from the uh, from the outsource of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so in that first, like, let's say like the first year that or just the early phases of, of the growth. I, I mean, was it, were you mostly leveraging just your own tool between the viral uh, loops? Like how else were you getting it out there? Yeah. The biggest thing, uh, the biggest thing for getting it out there is the big, 
biggest thing that I think still, like no matter what size company you are, is, uh, or at least uh, if you're not, unless you're Microsoft or like you're at the top of your marketplace, is still just getting in front of the right people and realizing that, you know, you don't necessarily have the audience. Somebody else has an audience. There, there is an audience somewhere for your product. Mm-hmm. Um, and chances are 90% of the people or 98% of the people you know, in your market that should know about, you know, your product or, or my product don't know about it. Right. And right. we tend to get really focused on, oh, like the competitor is doing this and they've got this many customers when uh, the reality is like, you know, there's enough market opportunity probably for you, your competitor and five other people doing the same thing if you would just get in front of the right people right um is at least the way it's always the way it's always seemed to me at this stage of the the market for uh for what we're doing now that's not necessarily the case if you're apple and samsung sure um but that's the case if you're you know a small you know a small and medium-sized company so like early on how how did you do that like what what was your first thing that, that really uh boosted that that exposure um you just like starting from a like the concept of concentric circles so like you know the circle of people that i knew about the product like i think our first paying customer was somebody that had worked for me before right. um and then uh and then say like, okay this the next level circle like can you tell your friends like that sort of viral like uh, that referrals uh thing from the people that had that early success um so there's two two ways to approach that the one way that we did was Every one of the first, you know, thousand people that signed up for the product, I would just talk to um, and say, you know, here's here's what you know, here's what I think about, you know, your campaign. Here's some personalized feedback. You know, if you thought this was useful, tell a friend. I just literally tell them, like, please yeah. tell a friend. Just like, it's almost like a manual product. version of your actual yeah, product. It's a, it's a manual version of the actual of the actual product. Like, because yeah. we've had it in the dashboard, of course, like a link to like tell your friend about us, but they would actually do it if I told them to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that became the uh, that became the, the biggest uh, the biggest thing, um, and then um, then other than that, finding people uh, in local like local groups. So my circle locally in Seattle, and going to meetups, going to entrepreneurial groups, doing pitch competitions. Um, I was uh, I, I found my, found a role as a, a judge, like judging ideas, because I was like, well, listen, I've seen a thousand people sign up and pitch their idea on my product, like yeah, here's I can offer feedback, and so I've judged uh, a lot of you know kind of local startup competitions um, to get the word out, um, sponsored some of the the local the local meetups, um, as well as just online like blogs and content, like people that have had interesting interesting blogs just telling them the story and saying hey here's uh, here's how uh, here's how we built this here's what we think works in this space you know i think your audience would be interested in this and they rework or redo the content and just put it in front of their audience and then honestly going to uh, neutral places like uh, Quora, like the question and answer groups on Quora, uh, was a big revenue thing for us early on of you know people literally ask the question is there a solution to easily put up five landing pages to test an idea? Like that was right. literally questions on Quora, yeah. and like, yeah, and let me give you some best practices along with that in yeah. the answer, and let me post about my product. And yeah, I'm the owner, but like you can check it out, check it out. Um, I would go there and answer every question I found yeah. um, to get in front of people, and then I would go and uh, take the ones, the answers that were popular, and I would add them to our blog and have official answers. Um, and then go, you know, kind of cycle back to core and answer the next one with an even better answer that I'd, uh, that I, that had gone, uh, that, that I'd had before. Yeah. Um, and then also, uh, uh, I said earlier, like paying attention to competitors is, uh, is, is maybe not the best thing to do, but, um, people on Twitter would post like, Hey, you know, using unbounce, but it's not great for startups or using this, this product, but it's not a great for con as great for contests. I would just look for those tweets and reply to them and say, "Hey, check check our product out um, on Twitter." So you just kind of do this like listening in these neutral platforms, and can you be helpful and instructive towards your own solution? Realizing that like I could shout all day long, like on I could have just shouted all day long if I didn't do any promotion of a blog post on our own blog, it wouldn't have gotten the reach that you know just even replying to somebody's tweet that just asked a one-off tweet about, is there a contest platform that does this, this, and this? Yeah. And just replying to that um, gets uh, got more play early on. And people are out there actively asking questions and like raising their hands saying, like, I have this need. Uh, yeah. Whether they're on Quora, Twitter, at a local meetup group, like those people are out there. You just have to kind of 
identify where where they're asking those questions, which communities they're in, and get in front yeah. of them and answer them. And I talk to I talk to customers all the time that uh, that tell me, like, man, I wish I'd found your tool like six months ago. I was trying to run this contest and you know like, I was trying to do it by hand and it didn't quite work. And it's and uh, <laughs> and and. They just did hadn't found the right place to ask the question, or I wasn't listening in the right places. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what leads me to my thing, led me back to my thing about like market share. Like, there's all these people who just need to know about your service because it's perfect for what they need, but they don't, they haven't heard about you yet. Yep. So in terms of uh, content, you, you mentioned that like you you started with doing some some Quora stuff and then taking those questions and then answering them on the blog. Mm-hmm. Um, how how early on did you start? thinking about content on your site, like that assets that, that you own on your, and, and were you executing all that yourself by doing the writing yourself? Early yeah. On? So early on I was doing all the writing myself and we were uh, posting a lot of stuff to the, to the, to the blog. Um, but I think it was important to realize, I think we were posting to the blog primarily at that point for the purposes of like, you know, can we get some topics to help us rank in SEO and boost the rank of our site by having a lot more pages? So it was a more old school approach. Um, or maybe I was, I was lowering my expectations about the blog. Like this is what, like this is really helpful for um, in, in terms of, in terms of having it. Cause I never viewed like, I think a lot of customers look at a blog, especially like new and small businesses, look at a blog and say, this is how we get the word out about our thing. And the answer is the blog is not a great place to get a word out because again, you, you have a megaphone, you have your own little audience, but your goal is to grow that audience, not just preach to that one little audience constantly. Yep. Um, and uh, and it grows you know, very slowly. If, if a blog is your only growth tool, it grows kind of like a little bit slowly at first. It takes a long time to build up momentum behind the blog. And most people don't realize that. Yeah. You know, there's fast ways for that initial growth. But um, as a long-term investment, the content uh, that we have on a blog just pays you know, constant dividends. So having it there is a good thing. But um, people make the mistake of thinking, oh, if I just publish 10 blog articles, I'll get 100 customers. Right. And it doesn't work that way. Yeah, I think you, you will, but it'll take the next few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, and I, I think it's equally about new acquisition as it is about just nurturing, yeah, your exist your 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 return cut uh, audience, you know, your return mm-hmm. visitors, um, getting them into your emails because, again, like there, it's that, you know, people will discover you today, but they may not have the need today, but yeah. if, if they can get onto your email list and you have some some content to nurture them and bring them back stay and stay back in their inbox that it really yeah. helps because um, that, that i mean that, and that's definitely true i mean that's something i so obviously you know <laughs> i'm preaching to the choir but like having having a larger audience to email to is great because then when we do product announcements you know not just blog posts when we announce stuff to that email list like hey we now have this functionality available for bigger functionality we always get a reply like oh I'm, you know this is exactly what i needed i'm going to upgrade today and you see like you know, a few minutes later, they go ahead and they upgrade, right? But they were sitting on that list for like, you know, six months right. um, before they uh, before they decide to upgrade. So you were doing uh, blog content yourself early on, mm-hmm. kind of focused on like SEO keywords and and, and mm-hmm. kind of evolving it over time. I mean, like, when did you uh, decide that like the blog is actually worth continuing to put that time investment in and, and later on, like really like growing it and doubling down on it? Um, it was a decision, uh, for me, I'll be honest, it was most, more of a decision based on faith, um, than it was based on facts, um, of where we where we saw our customers coming from, because it's really hard to trace the customer journey on a blog if they don't subscribe to something at the end of a blog post. But a blog does help, like, you can see, like, somebody would visit a page and you, you, you cookie them with a metrics tool or something. And then maybe three months later, they'd visit another blog post again on your site because it would come up on another search. And then a month after that, they'd sign up and, like, try your product or subscribe to your, your email newsletter. And so, but it's really hard to draw a direct line to, like, blog post equals revenue. It was more like blog post question mark revenue yep. um, on, the, on the side. So a lot of it was based on, on faith. Um, and then the other half of it is probably based on, you know, we started to think about our blog as a way to write helpful things for the existing customers. So once we had a large enough audience of existing customers that were consistently asking us internally the same questions, whether it be support focused or sort of an auxiliary question around our space, like, you know, hey, you know, what are the 
what what rules should we have if we're running a contest? What are the standard rules we should have? Like that's not something that our product is going to tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, you know, we're not a product for figuring out legally what sort of rules you should be running with your own your own contest. Um, but we could give you some best practice and guidelines and post that to the blog and then email our audience and say, by the way, here's some helpful things. You've asked this question a lot in support. And so it became, you know, 50% of my effort in the blog I wanted to invest in it was to support our existing customers. And the other 50% was as a group continuing to have faith of like blog post question mark profit um, as, a, as a user acquisition tool. Um, and so it really started to grow out of, and, and that really started to grow out of instead of questions externally, like from Quora, it started to grow out of questions we were getting internally from our customers that were using the product. Yeah. So like, like replies to emails, customer support questions, those are all just yeah. kind of getting recycled back into the, not recycled, but just yeah. gener- generating new topics for the blog. Gen- they're, they're generating, they're, there was a, that was a, a key content uh, source for us, mm-hmm. um, was, was an- trying to answer those questions um, that were constantly coming back in. So I guess marketing in general, how much of, of the actual work, the, the production work, are you handling yourself um, or, or, or putting other people in place to handle and like, how has that evolved over the last couple of years? Um, we've, uh, we've, we've had a couple of phases. So we've hired, uh, we've, I've hired some different, uh, different kind of marketing interns over time to like write up some content, take some drafts that I'd write or some topic ideas that we'd get from our customers. Uh, we've done that. Uh, we've uh, we've been uh, we've been an audience ops customer, so we've gone and had uh, team. You know, you guys have a team of writers writing content for us, uh, both that you're suggesting and then you know that we're suggesting. Is you know, hey, here's some topics we're hearing about that we want to make sure we have covered in the next uh, in the next month. Um, and then um, you know, we've also discovered as we've hired people on our team. They've got these additionally rich backgrounds. Like when we hired a designer, she was like, you know, I'm constantly getting these questions from customers, like, how does my page look? You know, can I write a series of articles and a checklist that's like, here's how to design the best looking landing page for X? Uh, and I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. Like as a bonus goal for what you're doing, like you own product design and like landing page template design and stuff. But yeah, let's take that since you're getting the question off enough from customers, and let's put that into a really great downloadable checklist for our customers so that you know they can start answering their own question. Like, is this design work? And like, they can, non-designers can go through the checklist and be like, oh, I probably shouldn't have five fonts on a page, right? Yeah. It says, <laughs> if you're not a designer, stick to one or two fonts on a page. You don't need five. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, because you'd be amazed what people who are not designers will do with uh, with design um, when they have the pro- when they have tools to let them be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like these design tools are just getting so easy to use, but that's that's kind of dangerous because at the end of the day, you know, yeah, you it's yeah, it's like the '90s and like when everybody started using PowerPoint. It's like PowerPoint made presentations super easy and like, but all of a sudden at the same time, like they became super ugly and yeah. super <laughs> horrible to look at and sit through because, and then you had this like revolt back to this you know minimal design of presentations and all these like simplified presentation tools that really put you on rails as it were of like creating a presentation because. Like people just went crazy one way uh, and they didn't know how to control themselves with the tool that PowerPoint gave them. Yeah. So, you know, one, one theme that that's come up in these interviews, the series of interviews here um, is, uh, you know, the, the companies who, who are really successful with content marketing specifically and mm-hmm. working with us, but also working with other, other outsourced writings or, or in-house writing mm-hmm. teams, um, they're the ones who are able to really translate th- their unique knowledge and insights mm-hmm. about their customer and their persona and give the writing team that critical feedback to make sure that they are r- really nailing the voice and the actual language that their customers are using and that sort of stuff. Um, and you yeah. guys have been just fantastic about that uh, since, since the beginning. Um, how, like, I guess talk to me a, a bit about that. Like, how, how do you ensure that First, you know exactly who your customer is and and that persona, and then second of all, like when you stop writing the blog content yourself as the founder, mm-hmm. how do you get somebody else to write as good, if not better, content? Um, yeah, I mean those are those are excellent questions, and I don't have a really simple answer. Like if you do this, it works. Um, I worked at Microsoft for eight years, and I was fortunate enough to work with some really, uh, some really great folks who were vice presidents even at the time, and now senior vice presidents at Microsoft. And 
I remember the one theme, like in one meeting where um, he was encouraging everybody to do customer support, customer support, and and the um, product lead, one of the product leads said, well, how are we going to know like what features resonate with people and how do we consistently make sure we're executing on the right set of features for the product for people? And the VP's answer was simple. He's like, he's like, it's just going to happen. If you talk to 10 customers a day, it'll be osmosis. You'll wake up the next day and you'll say, this is what they need. Right. Um, they're not going to tell you directly, but if you talk to enough customers, you will have the insight into what makes the feature work really well or what specific features they need. Um, and there was a lot of skepticism in the room about that. Um, but I think it's absolutely true. I think yeah. um, it's human. So right? it's like you, you're talking to people, you naturally want to help people. And the more you know someone, you know. Yeah. And the more you know your customer set, um, the more you can target to them and, and create a voice for them. And so what I've tried, what we've tried to do at Kickoff Labs is this culture that like, yes, we have a support person, um, but I still answer a lot of support um, questions. And everybody who works on the team has goals of participating in and product support, doing customer interviews, working with customers. So it's part of a goal. Like you could be a developer at Kickoff Labs. Um, you're going to have goals to answer customer support questions and to get engaged, even if the question could have been answered without you. Mm -hmm. I want you having that osmosis saying like, what are these real challenges that people are having? And that's invaluable because then people who work on our work on our um, product, both they have feature feedback and like, hey, you know, I just talked to the three customers who also had this problem. So I think this would be a great way to simplify and make this feature better. Uh, but then they also have content ideas like, hey, you know, like we should have something on the blog that talks about this because we're never going to do it in the product. But like people have this question all the time. Yeah. Um, and like, great, now you own it. <laughs> um, and uh, and so, uh, and, and I'm also, you know, I, I try to hire people that are just generally good communicators, um, partially, primarily because we're all a remote company and a remote team. And so if you don't communicate well with others uh, via chat, via email, online, you're not a good communicator in general. So a combination of encouraging, strong encouraging a culture where people are constantly talking to the customers that they're helping. Um, and then also, um, you know, making sure you're, you have a people in a culture that values that communication, um, yeah. you know, to each other and then back outwards of like, they want to help the customer because um, they have that communication skill and that desire at least to have the empathy. Totally. I, uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more about the communication piece, no matter what the role is, whether they're a developer, a project manager, a, a customer support, like there's yeah. always going to be like a top 5% that meet the the skill qualifications for the role. And then out yep. of that, it's like whoever's the best communicator answers all the questions, ask, asks all the right questions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And those people tend to, and so what I found is like, you have the com that combination of people and they tend to be able to carry forward, you know, voice because they're listening well enough to the customers. They have a voice that they, they understand how to reflect back to the customer in their own words, what the customer wants to hear. Yeah, totally. So, uh, so as we, you know, we start to wrap up here, um, what, so we're here, we are in like the middle of 2017, right? So what's, yeah. what's kind of coming up in terms of like, what are you trying to do in terms of optimization at this point, um, to grow on, on a marketing side and like kind of what, what's on the, on the horizon there? <laughs> Um, so we're trying to, uh, we've got such a wealth of content now since we've been around for six years. Um, we're really trying to optimize, um, you know, the repurposing of content, the discovery of content um, for customers who come into us new, um, because you know you get six years of the same questions. We realize that like, okay, we really have to make sure that people are walking a path and finding the stuff that's useful to them at the right time. Um, so recently, we went through and and reoptimized sort of our our drip campaigns when somebody gets onto our email list to segment them into what type of customer they are. Um, so I guess the first thing is like optimizing by segmentation is something that's now big, much bigger for us. So we can look at each segment, target them specifically. And we've asked for a long time when you sign up for a product, do you work in marketing for existing company trying to run a contest? Are you a startup trying to launch? Or are you an agency doing this for other people? And the content for those three groups is similar, but very different. Yep. Like they all have, at a root, they all have the same need. They want to they wanna generate leads, but the way that they're going about it is very different and the way that they talk about it 
is very different. And so um, we're trying to optimize uh, to smaller and smaller segments of our audience. So both along, like when they answer that basic question is one path, and then the other optimization is then, um, this isn't talking about outward marketing, this is like the people who find us, um, but it's a big part of marketing, um, and sign up for a free trial. And then uh, the people who, uh, once they sign they, they once they sign up and they're on one of those segments, um, you know, um, how do we take sort of the technology we have with our own product again and use it to score those leads and say, you know, boy, based on the actions that they're taking within our product, like these people are really valuable leads. Should we reach out to them more personally? Um, and kind of taking what we did early on of talking very individually and reaching out and giving them feedback, whether they asked for it or not on their campaigns to everybody, because we couldn't do that to everybody now. Are there 20 people a week we should be doing it with? So taking that concept of, you know, do stuff that doesn't scale, but then instead of going straight to like scale everything to this mass market, there's this middle ground um, for medium sized companies of, can you scale? Um, can you scale? Can you start like, Doing things that scale a little bit, yeah, or like you, you know, do some automated, delivery. like some automated lead some, scoring and some like customer path history, and then, exactly. and then just do manual outreach to them. And then just do manual outreach. So it's like it's like we're automating, but we're not doing that on a massive scale where it's all computer generated. And then we still just can reach out personally. Where you know, still taking advantage of the fact that we're not a large company and we can still be really nimble about that, mm -hmm. um, uh, but reaching out and then. In terms of uh, in terms of uh, like external in terms of like external marketing, um, you know we're still publishing we're still publishing to the to the blog and looking for topics and you know finding the right find the right things and then trying to promote those topics. Um, but we're also working on um, can we get into uh, new areas like kind of a, the same kind of can we scale areas like core like looking at things that are the most popular questions can we scale areas like. Facebook, like where are the most popular groups on Facebook talking about marketing and should we be engaged in answering questions there? Like where, and sort of scaling up what worked initially and then doing that on sort of a more automated, higher higher level than we were. So nice. half automation, half uh, half personally going out and doing it. And then, um, you know, we're, we always experiment with ads. We've always played with uh, with ads, but it's, I, I believe a presentation I've seen uh, several times now that says like, uh, it says like it's, you're in trouble if ads represent more than 10% of your revenue source because the the rules of the ads game can change like this. A competitor can raise the bid price on you. You know, Facebook could change and say this ad is now we don't support it, but this new ad doesn't work for you yeah. that they do support. And so, you know, you never want to be in a space where you're like completely dependent on some somebody else's rules. <laughs> totally. And and the uh, ads are these days like there's just so so many touches that a single customer will go through before they even try the product. That like yeah. the, the ad is just one of many touches, basically. Yeah. And so and 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 so then we we're also, you know, we're looking at like are there are, you know, are there people uh, the most some of those powerful stuff lately has been has been uh, really focusing on uh, so what you're doing, customer interviews and, and case studies. When people hear from customers like themselves, it really resonates. So yeah. if I have somebody who's trying to do lead generation for something, for a product they're going to launch on Kickstarter, I've got three case study interviews like where people have raised millions of dollars on Kickstarter and started with zero emails. Um, and I'm like, listen, this... <laughs> This guy is like very similar to you. You go listen to him or her talk for an hour and come back to me and like it doesn't matter what platform you use, but if you follow what they're saying, you'll be much better off. Exactly. Um, yeah. And that kind of content's been uh, been invaluable, which again is segmenting, creating something that's in more engaging than standard marketing and getting it to the right pe person at the right time. Awesome. Well, Josh, this has been really really helpful. Um, a lot of insightful stuff you, you guys have been through uh you know uh you guys have been around for a couple of years so you've, you've learned a ton and you've been able to really grow it um you know pretty it's, it's been really impressive to see the growth i, I think I, I did actually discover you guys really early on like in the like around 2011 2012 or something and and uh just been a fan ever since um so uh so yeah thanks for doing this yeah thanks for thanks for having me of course it's uh kickofflabs.com anywhere else people can connect with you um, kickofflabs.com, uh, kickofflabs on Twitter. Uh, just look me up, Josh Lightguard. I'm on Twitter. Or and if people want to reach out to me directly, just josh at kickofflabs.com. All right, great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>